All right, I am both really excited for the topics coming up, but also this is going to be quite a headache. So um, it's definitely something that's needed for consideration and something that will pop up, definitely pop up again in Chapter 11 and Chapter 12. Um, and quite frankly, I think it's worth considering uh, whenever we're dealing with a continuous distribution or even things that are moving. So uh, let's go ahead and dive in. So the statement wants us to confirm that the retarded potentials satisfy the Lorenz gauge condition. A hint that was given was first show that the divergence of J over R is equal to 1 over script R. Um, divergence of J plus 1 over script R J or divergence prime dot J minus the uh, prime divergence of J over script R. Okay, that's a bit of a headache looking like, but it looks like we're just trying to put some, force some pieces together. Um, but we have some new words here, so we'll have to be careful with them. And we need to note that the del operator denotes derivatives with respect to R and uh, del prime derivatives with respect to R prime. Next, noting that J R prime of T minus script R over C depends on R uh, prime both explicitly and through R and through script R, whereas it only depends on R or rather, whereas it depends on R only through script R, confirm that we have uh, divergence of J is equal to one over negative one over C J dot divergence or rather j dot uh, dot product of the divergence of script r and that we have del prime dot or so the divergence of del prime with j is equal to negative rho prime minus one over c j dot dot product del prime script r use the calculate use this to calculate the divergence of a or equation 10.26 Okay, so we have uh, a couple new terms that we have to deal with, so let's go over them real quick. The generalized potentials for non-static sources, we have VR of T is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. Looks all the same as what we had before, except now we have it evaluated at TR, which is known as the retarded time. Um, so let's take a look at why this matters. So... If we're trying to, since electromagnetic news travels at the speed of light, right, what we're interested in is not what the source is doing now, but what it did at some other time previously. That's what we're measuring when we're measuring anything to do with the fields right now is due to what the sources were doing at some earlier time. So since they have to travel some distance script R, and it only travels at some rate of change known as C, the speed of light, then the retarded time is the time now minus the distance that they had to traverse over the rate of change. Okay. So this is the, this is the big mental jump from what we did in chapter two, three, and then five, six to what we're going to see now. Because the sources, what the source did earlier determines what we're reading now due to the news traveling. So, and sometimes this approximation won't matter, but here we see that it does. So let's go ahead and start diving in on this. We're gonna have to use a lot of vector algebra and some theorems like Stokes theorem. So just prepare yourself if you're not ready. We got a bunch of things to t uh, fiddle around with. So the product rule tells us that we have that the divergence of J over script R is equal to one over R, keep that alone, right? Product rule. Uh, then we have divergence of J. Now we leave J alone, take the divergence of, or dot that with the, um, the gradient of one over script R. Similarly here, if we do the same thing with a prime coordinate, we just put the primes accordingly, but now we'll color code one of them red, okay? Reason why is because we'll have to substitute that in later. Now let's note that script R is equal to R minus R prime, right? Field point, source point, and the, the difference is 
from the source point to the field point, right? Because R was the origin uh, point, and then R prime was the uh, source point. So the difference to the field point is script R. Um, but nonetheless, then we see that the divergence, or rather the gradient of one over script R, is equal to the divergence of one over R minus R prime, which is equal to negative, uh, which is also equal to the negative of the del prime on script R. So we see that because R and minus R prime are in the denominator, by putting the negative in there and changing the coordinate, we have the negative that's attached to the R prime. Uh, so what we're gonna do there now is plug that in accordingly. So we see that the divergence of J over script R, now for the uh, gradient of one over script R, we just plug in a prime coordinate and we set, and then we just shove that through, um, meaning that now that we have that, we use the link that we know from the red, and we substitute that in, okay? So with that, uh, we've got to be a little careful here because the negative goes through. We see that we have uh, negative j dot the gradient prime of 1 over script r, which is the red component of what we had in the second product rule. So now that we team them up with red and red, what we're going to do is solve the second product rule for the red part and substitute that in. So that's why we have 1 over script r, j, r, 1 over script r, divergence of j minus the bracket and now we're able to see where we get the uh, del prime uh, divergence of j over r minus the one over script r uh, del prime dot with j that all comes from the second product rule all we did was solve it for the red term and thus we get this relationship between the divergence of j over script r and the prime coordinate systems so all we did was substitute one product rule into the other. That's all it really was, but it's a mess, so that's why it looks funky. All right, now here's where the vector algebra starts to get messy. We know that the we know that the divergence of J needs a chain rule. Okay, so we know that the typical divergence is JX over X derivative, JY Y derivative, and so on. But since we know we have to evaluate with respect to the retarded time, we know that we have to, in order to get to X, we have to go from J through R, through TR, to, and then TR to get to X. So this is the expanded chain rule on it. We've seen it in calculus, using it again, without a doubt. Um, so we have to tag everything with the retarded time, and that's where things start to get messy. So with that, we see that uh, TR, uh, dx gives us a negative 1 over c uh, from the definition of retarded time, which was t minus script r over c. So that's, you see where we're getting the uh, uh, negative r over c from. And so that's what we have there. t doesn't matter, it's just a constant. But with that being said, we have a negative 1 over c in every component. So we pull that out. Now we're left with a, a modified chain rule where we have from JX to TR through script R to X and then all the other components. Now what this looks like is actually a dot product. And then you see we have the derivative with the retarded time dotted with the uh, spatial derivatives of the script R. So if that's the case, we factor out the time the retarded time derivative to the left and we put that the uh, script R can be taken out to the right but since it has a component now since they're componentized we know that that was a gradient operator so we put it into the gradient form and we see that J goes back to just its normal vector form and hence we put it back to boldface so we see in blue we get negative 1 over C dj vector over dtr dot it with the gradient of script r. How cool is that? And then we also see here that if we did the prime coordinates, we have prime divergence of the vector j, which is a function of r prime in the retarded time, and that's equal to negative d rho dt minus 1 over c uh, partial j 
over TR dot the prime derivative uh, prime gradient of script R. So the first term arises when we differentiate with respect to the explicit script R, okay? Because we know from the uh, continuity equation that the negative divergence gives us uh, d rho dt, so put the negative over, good there, and that's where we see the first term. And thus, uh, let's move on. So now we're left with, uh, well, what is this uh, j dot, uh, everything else that we saw? Um, or well, excuse me, what was the uh, del prime operator acting on j through the retarded time? And that's where we used what we solved in the first half of the problem. So the divergence of j uh, over script r gives us one over r from the product rule. We solved that all in the first time. But you see the blue and the purple are what we color coordinated from our last question or the last part of the question. So we go ahead and plug those parts in. All right, good to go there. Now once we do that, now we just kind of simplify and tidy up all the vector algebra that we possibly can, which will get messy and messy and messy. But you see that that uh, we know that that del operator in the red acting on script R is also equivalent to putting a negative sign on the prime operator. So we see if we substitute that in, we can cancel out the uh, one over script R, one over C, evaluate it, and then the retarded time derivative, and they cancel out quite nice. How awesome is that? And then we're left with um, that negative one over or script R d rho dt minus del prime dotted with j over script R. Now, we know that the uh, divergence of A is equal to... Um, u naught over 4 pi bracket negative uh, time derivative of rho over script r d tau minus the, um, uh, what, what am I saying, minus the del prime dotted with j over uh, script r d tau, okay? Those were the potential formulations that we were given. But now that we know what the divergence is for both of these things and we can push it on through, we can now put in what we need. So here are, uh, in our case here, we factor out the uh, time derivative from the integral side. At, well, excuse me, we split everything up, the mu naught over four pi into the bracket, so we can split them up. We input a uh, epsilon naught, which we see in red, and we do that so we can form match to V, okay? And then we use Stokes' theorem on that uh, divergence integral, yeah, on the divergence integral to a closed integral, okay? And so we see this is a surface at infinity, so that kind of goes bye-bye. We don't really care about it. Uh, physically, it means nothing to us. So to simplify this all the way down, we have that we have uh, divergence of A, okay, which we got again from J, is equal to negative mu not epsilon naught d by dt of v, once we substitute its form in, and then since uh, the surface integral goes to zero at infinity, that whole part goes to zero, and we are left exactly with the Lorenz condition. Um, this is a horrifically messy problem uh, with the vector algebra, so take as much time as you need to go back through it, see it again and again and again, because, uh, yeah, it's not always pretty. But that's a pretty cool result nonetheless.